Hello, today I have an interview with the authors of a book called Mr. Nice Guy, and we'll discuss a funny story about the semicolon and what it's like to work as an author team and more. But I know some of you listen to the podcast with your kids, and so I want to give you a heads up that the book deals with adult themes. There's nothing explicit in the podcast, but it does mention a couple of times that the characters have sex. So if that's a problem, you'll want to listen to it later. Okay, let's get started. I'm Mignon Fogarty, and I'm here today with Jennifer Miller and Jason Pfeiffer, co-writers of the new book, Mr. Nice Guy. Thanks for being here today. Thanks for having us. us. You bet. Well, I'm I'm almost through the book. I stayed up really late last night reading, but I just couldn't quite stay awake to finish it. But it is a lot of fun. Self Magazine describes it as the Devil Wears Prada meets Sex in the City. So, um, Jennifer and Jason, can you give our listeners a little rundown on what the book's about so I don't reveal any spoilers. Sure. So Mr. Nice Guy is about two journalists who every week sleep together and then critically review each other's sexual performance in a magazine. Um, It (laughs) is in some ways based on Jason and my very long time working in New York City magazine. So it's kind of set against the backdrop of a very lavish and cutthroat industry. Yeah, I was actually going to ask you about that. So, Jennifer, it says you frequently write for the New York Times style section. And, Jason, you're the editor-in-chief of Entrepreneur Magazine. So how many of the little details in this book come from, you know, your own lives or details drawn from things you've seen while working in the industry? Oh, a lot of it. Uh, So most of it is drawn from an earlier time in our lives. I moved to New York in 2008 to work at Men's Health. And that was a crazy experience. That was also when I met Jen. So we were dating during that time and we had both gotten out of long-term relationships. And so we were both kind of fumbling our way through the dating scene. And also Men's Health was a unbelievable entry into the weird world of media in excess. I was doing a lot of the (laughs) coverage of celebrities for the magazine. So we got invited to all of these lavish parties, movie releases, and weird events where whiskey companies would just throw a ton of money at something for no clear reason. And uh, we, yeah, we, we were, we were perplexed and amazed by that time. And that is what we pulled from. Yep. And and my reporting for the New York Times, especially for the style section, you know, I've just gotten to cover some really crazy characters and um, been to some of the insane parties that they've thrown. So, um, you know, a lot of those details also made it into the book. It's really an insider's look into the world of magazines. That is amazing because I found it it was pretty outrageous, some of the stuff. And to think that some of it uh, might be true or close to the truth, that's that's stunning. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. You know, it's funny, like the conversation that we would have over and over again when we would go to these things is, why does this exist? Yeah. Like, what what are, what are they trying to do? Because no, nobody will ever follow up with you and ask you for anything. It's just this, this spending of money for, we, we could just never figure out right. why. It's like, how did we get here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, that makes the book even more interesting in retrospect, knowing that, that there's elements of truth to it. Wow. Okay, so you mentioned that you um, you met well in the early stage of your career while you were working in magazines, and you told me a, a great story about how that had happened. Can you share that with the listeners? <laughs> Both of us, um, like Jason had said, had just gotten out of long-term relationships. We had never really dated before, so we both spent a long time dating online. And when when we met, you know, this was pre-swiping. So Tinder didn't exist. Bumble didn't exist. So you'd put a lot of effort and care into writing your profile. And of course, us being two writers, it was really important that you know, the people that we were going out with knew how to put two words together. And so when Jason emailed me, um, when he messaged messaged me in OkCupid, he, you know, not only was cute and, you know, seemed to be a guy I might get along with, but he used an amazing grammatical, an amazing punctuation mark, the semicolon, which is like pretty (laughs) serious grammar. You have to like really know your stuff to use a semicolon. So I was like, I've got to go out with this guy. It's a strong move, <laughs> right, the that semicolon. Is, that is some advanced stuff, the semicolon. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, I want to show that I, uh, I'm no dummy. <laughs> you know, I mean, you get, 
<laughs> you get the uh, you just get the dumbest dumbest messages on these things, and I, I I don't even really remember using the semicolon intentionally. I think I actually just dropped it because, but I was definitely aware that I was competing in a marketplace of a lot of noise. And so, especially if I'm going to reach out to somebody who I know is smart and accomplished, I wanted to make sure that she understood that I I could roll like that. Yeah, Jason also put into the search bar Jewish journalist. So he was <laughs> looking for a writer, which is why would you look for a writer like that? <laughs> like I have been dating a lot of musicians and like you don't actually want a serious relationship with a musician. I kind of think you don't want a serious relationship with a writer either. Just because of the anxiety? <laughs> yeah, totally. <laughs> Well, actually, so you're a married couple and you wrote this book together, and I'm absolutely fascinated to hear what it's like because I keep trying to get my husband to write with me, and he won't do it because he thinks it would be bad for our relationship. So so tell me the truth. What's it like, the good and the bad? Oh, I thought it was great. I mean, it was great for us. I can totally appreciate that it isn't right for everybody. We had laid the foundation for this a long time ago. I mean, when we were dating, very early on, Jen had asked me to edit uh, a version of her very first novel. And, you know, that could have gone south in any number of ways. And <laughs> I really, I tread very carefully, but what I did is I, instead of editing it the way that I would a magazine piece where, like, I think of myself as the gatekeeper for the magazine, and instead I was just thinking, okay, if something doesn't work in here, if there's a scene or something that doesn't work, I will just circle it and I'll ask her what she was going for, like, what was the intention of this moment, and then we'll work together on it, which actually was really good for, I think, the book and me learning as an editor and our relationship. So we've collaborated quite a lot in the past. I would show her stuff that I was working on. She'd show me stuff. And and neither of us are particularly precious about our work, which I think is really important if you're going to collaborate. Mm-hmm. Um, but also, I think if you're just going to be a writer in general, it's really important to not be precious. So by the time that we decided to do this, I think we each understood how the other works, how we work well together, and what we could each bring to the project. But that is not to say that everybody, you should like baby step your way into it. I would would not suggest (laughs) diving into a project like this as the first thing, but collaborate in small ways and see if you can calibrate to each other. Yeah, that's good. I am. Um, I edit his stuff sometimes, and he does give me feedback on my work too, but not a lot. Like you're right, maybe maybe a short story or or something like that would be some a place to start. We're going to take a quick break for our sponsors, but stick around because when we get back, we'll hear more about how Jason and Jennifer work as a writing team, why they favor straightforward language, and even though the semicolon brought them together, why they're both so attached to using the colon. Are you too busy to make it to the post office? Well, Stamps.com brings all the amazing services of the U.S. Postal Service right to your computer. You can print official U.S. postage for any letter, any package, any class of mail, anywhere you want to send. Then all you have to do is drop your mail in the mailbox. It's perfect for a small office sending invoices, an online seller shipping products, or even a warehouse sending thousands of packages a day. Plus, you get five cents off every first class stamp and up to 40% off priority mail. I used Stamps.com when I did the crowdfunding campaign for my card game, Pivors, a few years ago, but only after the post office told me about it. I packaged up my games and lugged a huge card of them to the post office, and then the person at the counter just looked at me, shook his head, and kind of with pity in his eyes said, you should have used Stamps.com. And he was right. It was vastly easier and cheaper. And right now, my listeners, you can get a four-week trial plus free postage and a digital scale without any long-term commitment. Just go to Stamps.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in Grammar. That's Stamps.com and enter Grammar. This episode is also supported by the Next Generation Bona Premium Spray Mop for hardwood floors. With the Bona Premium Spray Mop, you can clean quickly, easily, and effectively with no dulling residue left behind. It's the perfect solution for simply beautiful floors. The refillable Bona Premium Spray Mop comes with ready-to-use hardwood floor cleaner and a microfiber cleaning pad that's reusable and machine washable. You'll love the extra supportive foam handle and comfort grip, and it cleans 40% faster than the leading competitor. It really does. Plus, its soft, flexible corners prevent damage to baseboards and furniture. 
It's so great to have advertisers whose products I love. I used my Bonamop yesterday and was raving to my husband about how much better it is than what we were using before. Our neighbors are doing construction right now, so our condo is always dusty. So we're cleaning the floor more often, and with the Bona Mop, it takes half the time and it gets the floors cleaner. The Bona Premium Spray Mop is available at most retailers where floor cleaning products are sold, on Amazon and at Bona.com, B-O-N-A.com. Also try Bona's Premium Spray Mop for stone, tile, and laminate floors. Find exclusive offers and more at Bona.com slash grammar. I think it's really important to know what each person's strength is, like what they bring to it so that you understand how you fit together as a puzzle. I mean, Jen really understands narrative and character development. I, that is not my strength because I come from nonfiction, and but she's written prior novels. Uh, and I, because I come from magazines, am really good at punchiness and condensing things. And so Jen, we plotted this book out together, but then Jen wrote most of the narrative. Right. So when we decided to to start working on Mr. Nice Guy together, almost from the beginning, we figured out who was going to kind of own which part of the writing process. So like Jason just said, I wrote the bulk of the narrative. But then, you know, because this book is about two people who are columnists and they are critiquing each other in a magazine, we needed to put all of the columns in the magazine. So, you know, I really thought that Jason you know, being a magazine editor and having written columns would be great, um, would be really great as as the person to write those columns. So that that was the role that that he took on. And it was it was really fun. It was like kind of fun to get inside each other's heads to understand like how we see the world, like how we see sex, because we're writing a lot about sex in this book, actually. And, um, you know, well, that's a whole other level for our partnership (laughs) as a artistic collaboration (laughs) and marriage. (laughs) Yeah, no, it's fascinating. And and the book, I, I will say, too, about the writing, it was really clear and straightforward. Like, I can tell that you both come from the magazine world because it's just, it's a fast read. It's It's just really, the writing is just so straightforward. It, I I really liked that part about it, that it was just, you could just go through it and you, know, you weren't have to dig out all the different meanings. Um, yeah. Actually, can, can I just so, say something about straightforward writing? Uh, I had, yes, I, and I appreciate that, that you, you call that out. So as many young writers do, I used to think that the key to successful writing was to be as complex and dense and, and <laughs> flowery. flowery, right? Like bells and whistles. And then I, when I got that job at Men's Health, which which had a, a real house style to it of, of crisp writing and very straightforward, um, I tried to adjust to that style. And I remember writing this piece. It was like the first profile that I ever wrote, which I think might have been on Paul Pierce, who was a, a Celtics player at the time. And I got a bunch of emails from readers and they were all like, Hey, I really like how, like, I really like how, how simple and understandable this was. It was like things that if people had said this to me a year or two ago, I would have found as an insult, but instead I came to understand (laughs) was something that they really valued. And that made me think very differently about my own writing. And I, I developed a very different writing voice that I really like now, which is how I speak. I think uh, I speak fast and I want my writing to read fast. Like I, I want it to feel like a slip and slide. Like you get on it and you just move, <laughs> you just move through it. And, um, and that means, yeah, that means not tripping people up unnecessarily. Yeah. And I would say you definitely achieved that. And also the, it's f- funny because I can tell now that this is sort of based on your real life experiences because Lucas, the main character in the book, he also goes through those sort of thought processes about his writing. He starts out, you know, wanting, if I, wanting to use he wanted to impress his editor, essentially, and, and thinking about his writing in that way. Yeah. Oh, I, I very, I drew a lot. We drew a lot of from my own experience and put it into Lucas. Uh, I, in a way, Lucas felt like, like an airing of my embarrassments. <laughs> <laughs> well, so I just think you, you, so you might have a sentimental attachment to the semicolon because it helped you meet. But you told me that you also love another punctuation mark and tend to overuse it, the colon. Yes. And I oh, thought man. that was fa- <laughs> <laughs> I he- thought that was so fascinating because most people overuse the dash. And the dash, and a lot of times you can use them interchangeably, the dash or the colon. So I want to hear why you prefer the colon to the dash. You know, I think that it is, it is, um, with, with the dash, you 
you almost use it more intentionally. So I think that like like perhaps the reason that we don't overuse M dashes is that it's easier to know that you're doing it. Whereas there's something mm-hmm. about the colon, which is just sneakier. Like, like it just kind of, you know, suddenly it's there on the screen and you're, and you're, <laughs> you know, describing a list. Um, I mean, I, it's so strange. I recently had an article in the Washington Post magazine and it wasn't until I was looking through the final proofs on the page that I realized I had put a colon in like every single graph. I was like, this is no good. (laughs) And fortunately, like at the last minute, I was able to get them to like go back and excise all the colons. Um, But yeah, Jason, why do you use them all the time? I think I use them all. So it really goes back to that slip and slide thing. Like I want every sentence to feel like it connects to the next sentence in a really fluid way. And so I think I end up being tempted to use the colon because it announces that the sentence that follows is connected to the sentence previous. And I I just want to lock everything together so much. And I'm thinking a lot lot about how one thing leads exactly to the next and one thing sets up the next. And then I I end up over-relying upon this punctuation to announce that, which you don't really need because if you're writing it, it just should connect. And that's the thing that I I always learn every single time uh, that my my piece goes through a copy edit is uh, my copy editor will just take out all these colons and it reads exactly the same. They just weren't necessary. They didn't need to be there. (laughs) They just help you get through that first draft. (laughs) Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. They're like, they're right. It's, it's like, uh, it's like the scaffolding, right? And then you take the scaffolding down and the building is still there. Thankfully. Yes. Right. Yeah. So tell me about your editing process. How do you, you know, do you do lots and lots of drafts? Do you, you know, write it out once and then go back and change the wording or like, how, how do you put it all together? So I think it's different for a novel than it is for writing a piece of journalism. Uh, For Mr. Nice Guy, we really, um, so I I really just kind of banged it out. I I did not, I I really try not to go over sentences again and again and again, because I find that when I'm writing fiction, I will never actually move forward. I will just kind Mm -hmm. of be, you know, retreading my steps. And, um, and I think, you know, when you're writing a novel, it's really, really important to have that forward momentum because it's hard. It's hard to look at a blank page. It's hard to, I find it difficult to use my imagination. I mean, I love doing it, but it's actually like very strenuous and exhausting. Um, And so I Mm -hmm. need to kind of get that momentum, which means that if I try to edit while I'm writing, it's going to be a complete disaster. But then once I've actually got a chapter written or I've got a couple of chapters written, like then I can go back and and now start looking at the language and refining and like making sure that it's, you know, exactly what I want it to be. And then it's great to then, you know, in with me and Jason to have a partner who can then take a look at, you know, that raw material um, or even the edited material and then punch it up even more. Um, and so that's really what we did for each other is, is you know, we kind of wrote our own parts of the book. We edited our own parts of the book and then we swapped and then we edited each other's writing. (laughs) Um, And um, I think that's hopefully what what makes the book feel like it's fluid and not piecemeal because, you know, there are two authors. Right. Yeah. People people have told us that they've been trying to guess who wrote what. And it's hard because both everything in the book has multiple passes from both of us on it. So it, it has blended our voices. Um, for, for, for my own stuff, I tend to think about whatever I'm writing, whether it's a 300 word piece or a 3000 word piece or longer as, um, I try to think about the architecture of it. You know, you're trying to, each piece has a couple different acts and you're trying to get, there's, there's the setup and then there's the expressing this idea and that idea. And so they end up feeling like blocks. And so what I tend to do is work through one of those blocks and then go back and read it all and feel and see if it feels like they connect. And then I work on the next block. And sometimes those are actually structured out, right? If you're writing a long magazine piece, it'll have three, four or five sections. And so you could work on sections. But for example, a podcast script of 5,000 words uh, that that will have like six or seven blocks in it of, of topic or information. And the listener may not really see it. And in fact, shouldn't see it. They shouldn't see that architecture. But I think of it that way. And so I just try to push myself through one of them and get to the finish line and then reassess. 
Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it sounds like a really fun way to write, to be going back and forth like that with a writing partner. And I will say, when I first started reading Mr. Nice Guy, I was trying to guess which part each of you had written, and I quickly gave up because it feels, it's very cohesive. There's no way to tell who wrote what. It's, it's, it all flows as though it's one wonderful author. <laughs> thank you. That's that's awesome to hear. That yeah, was definitely our goal. thank you so much. <laughs> yeah. So, Jennifer, we also emailed about our favorite words, and I particularly loved yours, which was gloaming. Oh, I had yeah. never heard it before, and I would just love to hear, um, you know, why you love it. So gloaming is one of those words that I feel, I feel like it just, the word itself and the sound of the word just really expresses the feeling of the word and the definition of the word. So, so the gloaming is kind of that that period of the day that is right around dusk. It's kind of the moment of the day just before, it's like a specific part of dusk, just before um, it, you know, it totally becomes nighttime and everything is kind of blue, violet, and has has this kind of melancholy glow. Um, and there's something about the, the GL, like, so it's got that glow, but then the M that kind of shows up in the middle of the word um, <laughs> kind of gives it a darker tonality in a way. Um, and yeah, it's just so atmospheric. Um, I think, you know, I don't know where I first encountered that word, but I've got to think that it possibly came, it must have come from some British literature that I was reading as a kid, maybe Tolkien, something like that. Um, so, so yeah, it's just the atmospheric and um, just because it's so specific is why I love it. The phrase in the yeah, gloaming I've, seems to like, I feel like that's the only time I've ever heard the word gloaming is in the phrase in the gloaming. <laughs> Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, because I hadn't heard it, I looked it up and it, the Oxford English Dictionary says it's rare and it's primarily Scottish. So it was probably, you're probably right that it was something British or Scottish that you were reading because it it just doesn't show up very much. And it's actually, it's it's so interesting. I love word history. So um, it comes from the same Proto-Germanic word that gave us the word glow. And so you're right, it does have that feel of the nighttime and it's modeled after um, evening. So it probably means something Thing like the glowing, which is sort of what this guy does at that time of night. So it's it's a beautiful. It's what it's my favorite favorite word that an author has told me so far. <laughs> wow, that is such an honor. <laughs> I love it. The small Thank honors you. in the world, right? <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being here today. Um, tell people where to find both of you online, and most important, where they can get Mister Nice Guy. Sure. So um, you can find Mister Nice Guy. Anywhere that you get your books, go to Amazon, go to your favorite independent bookstore. Um, we, we've also recorded the audiobook. Actually, Jason and I um, recorded uh, Carmen and Lucas's columns. That's where all the kind of sexy, saucy stuff is. That was very awkward. <laughs> very awkward. <laughs> <laughs> um, our How parents fun. <laughs> will not be listening to that, hopefully. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, we really hope that you pick up a copy of Mr. Nice Guy. And then in terms of finding us, um, Jason? Yeah, so we're on. We're both on social media, Twitter and Instagram. Our handles are the same. I'm at Hey Pfeiffer, H E Y F E I F E R. I will warn you, I am far more active than Jen is, uh, and then she is Prop Jen, Prop Jen, which is a reference to the Wire, Prop Joe, and um, and you should if you if you read the book uh, or if you have thoughts about the semicolon uh, or colon, you should reach out. <laughs> Excellent. Well, again, I was talking with Jennifer Miller and Jason Pfeiffer, authors of Mr. Nice Guy. And I'm Mignon Fogarty, better known as Grammar Girl. That's all. Thanks for listening. 